Um, I jotted out a couple of notes because I'm usually terrible at doing this sort of thing, but it is my pleasure to introduce someone who not only works on galaxies, but is actually working on pieces of astronomy and galaxies that are actually good and interesting. So um, it's rare to see that. Now, this may be because Professor Kirkpatrick, Allison to some of us, uh, is one of the rare astronomers who began her career with a BS in mathematics. So I think that gives her sort of a, a good eye to sussing out the things that make sense and the things that don't make sense. Now, she earned her PhD at UMass Amherst in 2016, and as part of that became expert in that crucial intersection between star formation and dusty galaxies in AGN, and then had a very short stint at Yale on fellowship before getting very quickly faculty job at KU in 2018. So uh, during her time there, she's of course been continuing to work on this exciting intersection, finding uh, really cool things that she's gonna talk about in this talk, I hope, um, but has expanded her work to include a lot of undergraduates in her research, graduate students, postdocs. Um, and as part of those efforts has been also working hard to improve inclusion and equity in astronomy and in the broader community. I hope we talk about some of that during dinner because that's important to many of us here as well. So hopefully we can learn what things are working, what things are helping and how we can improve things here too. But in the meantime, scientifically, I wanna focus on the exciting stuff that's gonna be in this talk on black holes from the brain to the breathtaking, including the recent discovery of things I'm not gonna name that you'll see soon. So thank you very much. Awesome. I don't wanna spoil the whole thing. Okay, great. Um, oh no. Nope, there we go. Okay, um, awesome. Thanks, you guys, so much for having me here. Um, it is a cold snap in Kansas right now, so I was very happy to get on the airplane yesterday and leave that behind. Um, right, so I work on black holes of um, all different kinds, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two different populations here. Um, just to start, I always like to to start by showing my group, um, because most of the work that you're gonna see here, um, I am the chief intellectual, but they do a lot of the analysis. Uh, and so, so you're gonna see a lot of my students work here, which I am so grateful for my group. Okay, so I wanted to start um, <clears throat> with the two classic graphs that um, probably you've seen at some point. Uh, and on the, the left-hand side here, it is the relationship between the mass of a black hole and the mass of stars in a galaxy. And so every galaxy above a certain mass threshold has a supermassive black hole at the center. And if you measure the mass of these and you measure the amount of stars and the amount of stellar mass in a galaxy, it turns out they're very tightly correlated. Okay, um, this is all based on, on local galaxies. But then it turns out if we actually make this measurement uh, in a global way as well, like universally, you also see correlations. Um, and so the plot on the the left or the right is is our recent work based on X-ray AGN. So I want you to, for the purposes of this talk, just look at the blue line. Everything else is theory. Um, but this is the black hole accretion rate density in the universe. So if you were to measure a box, and put that box back in time at different steps and you measure the amount of matter falling onto your black holes, that's what you get. And then you can make the same measurement for the amount of star formation that you have. Um, and they have the same shape. Um, so the star formation is shown in the gray and the black hole is shown in the blue and they have the same shape and they peak around um, redshift of two. And so we call this epic cosmic noon. Prior to that is cosmic dawn and nowadays everything's slowing down. We're kind of in cosmic happy hour. Uh, things just aren't growing as fast. Okay, so if I was standing up here 15 years ago, I would show you both of these plots and I would say black hole growth and stellar mass growth are linked somehow and it is causal. The black hole is doing something to the galaxy. The black hole and the stars know about each other. Black hole is regulating star formation. And that was the common picture of how these graphs were interpreted. But I wanna take a step back and I want us to do something that we don't do in astronomy very often. And I want us to just think about the size of what we're looking at here. So if we're talking about galaxies and we have disk galaxies with this beautiful spiral structure, 
disk galaxies, like our own Milky Way, are 100,000 light years from edge to edge, okay? When we talk about the bulge, which is again, where most of the stellar mass is. Okay, so now we're talking about a little bit of a smaller region, but your bulge is really about 10,000 light years across. All right, 10,000 light years. And now we can talk about the supermassive black hole. So you can show a zoom in video of one of the black holes that we've taken an image of. And so we're gonna be looking at M87. This is a massive elliptical galaxy. Again, about 100,000 light years across. And as we zoom in, the first thing that we're gonna see is the X-rays. So this is the hot gas. It extends much, much further than the galaxy itself. And then we'll zoom in even further. And now we're at the optical. So now we're at a radius of 100,000 light years. Then we see our radio jet and we zoom down the radio jet. And now we have to switch over to the millimeter for us to zoom all the way down to the black hole itself. Okay. And so what you're seeing here is the last, the innermost stable circular orbit. Um, so essentially the edge where things fall into the black hole. And a black hole of this size is about the size of the solar system. And if you don't think in terms of like how big is the solar system, a light year at most, okay? Um, and so we are talking about, when we look at this graph here, this correlation between black hole mass and central bulge mass, we are talking about something that is maybe a light year on a good day um, to something that is 10,000 light years across. And in fact, that same order of magnitude translates to their masses as well. We are talking about a difference in masses of five orders of magnitude. So why are they correlated? Is the black hole really doing anything to the galaxy? If it was, this is what it would look like. This is a nice simulation showing a black hole in the center of a disk galaxy. So let's say that you have accretion onto a black hole, then you are able to launch these winds and these jets, and these winds are what regulate star formation. Well, if that is true, then your winds have to spread throughout the entire galaxy. And that's what that would look like. So there's some problems with this picture that black holes regulate star formation in galaxies. The first problem is that there's no smoking gun for AGN feedback in galaxies. Individually, yes, you may see winds, like in a handful of galaxies. Are those winds enough to disperse the entire interstellar medium and shut down star formation, maybe in like one or two galaxies. But as a population, we do not see that. What we do see is we know these galaxies have these powerful radio lobes and powerful jets, but those are oriented out of the plane of the galaxy usually. Um, and so you can have radio jets and still have star formation. Um, what it's doing is heating the circumgalactic nuclear, um, circumgalactic nuclear region. So you are heating gas and you are preventing star formation in the future. Okay, so that's one problem. The next problem is that AGN go through activity cycles. So even if you want to look for a correlation between AGN, um, so AGN being accretion onto your supermassive black hole, if you want to look for that correlation between AGN and star formation in a galaxy, which I do, that is part of my work, um, for AGN, you're usually measuring the accretion rate instantaneously. Uh, because of where the structure is that you are able to measure. For star formation, on your best day, you're measuring star formation over the past 10 million years. Okay, and so AGN can flicker and that can obscure any correlation. The other problem is that there's multiple types of AGN. So you have these huge radio galaxies, and then you also have very low luminosity AGN in normal disk galaxies. Are they having the same effect on their host? So to look for evidence of feedback that AGN might be impacting star formation in some way, you have to look at the extreme AGN, okay? Because you have to have an effect that you can measure. To understand the broader correlation between AGN and star formation in the galaxy, you have to do population statistics because you have to be able to average out of that AGN flickering effect. 
So I'm going to talk briefly about both of those because I work on both ends um, of this uh, of this spectrum here. Okay, so let's start with the breathtaking AGN. The population that I work on um, is called cold quasars. Let's talk about what quasars do. So the general picture of quasar formation, when we say quasars, I am referring to the most active um, supermassive black holes, the one that are accreting the most material, and they're usually the biggest as well. Okay. Um, there is a picture that is based on work in the local universe, but then also um, simulations that talk about how quasars form. And so the idea is that to get something like that's this active, you need two merging galaxies. So two gas rich spirals slam into each other. Um, this merging phase starts a burst of star formation. So they go through this brief um, extreme star formation episode. At the same time, you are starting to fuel gas down to your central black holes, which will, should have collided, uh, and you will get a red quasar. So you have this extreme black hole growth, but you have a lot of circumnuclear material, okay? So you have a lot of gas and a lot of dust. Uh, that obscures light. And so these will appear as red because dust makes light red. Um, then as your quasar structure evolves, it will launch jets and these jets can clear the circumnuclear material. And so now you'll have a blue quasar. At the same time, star formation in the host galaxy should be declining. And so you'll be left with an early type galaxy. Um, and you know, we see evidence for this, for, for the fact that quasars move from highly obscured to unobscured. Okay, the question is, does that actually track with star formation in a galaxy? Yes. No. Yeah, so how do you know like the steps? Like you don't know, sometimes maybe the quasar turns on first and star formation maybe follows. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> um yeah, yeah. So this is a that is an excellent point. I want everyone to bear this in mind. This is spoken as truth a lot. It is a simplified picture um, that is based on simulations and and it is based. Like we have an expert in the room today on, on local luminous infrared galaxies. You do see correlation of star formation and AGN with merger stage in local galaxies. Um, okay, so, but to actually test this picture, um, we need, uh, you need a wide area survey. Uh, so James Webb is not gonna be helpful here because it's a pencil beam. And to find the most extreme things, you need to cover a lot of area. So we looked at um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, the Stripe 82 region. And Stripe 82 is nice. It's a 16 degrees square survey, the area that we looked at, that has Herschel data. So Herschel covers the far infrared and it has X-ray data. X-ray can be used to select AGN and then Herschel can be used to probe the host galaxies. And so we had about 3,000 X-ray selected sources. Um, and so you can see the distribution down here of the X-ray luminosity versus redshift. Um, I called anything above 10 to the 44 a quasar. But then on top of that, because we had um, spectra, we can actually go look at the broad lines. And so anything with broad lines is an unobscured quasar. Um, and it had to meet a certain um, B-band magnitude as well to be considered a blue unobscured quasar. So there are about 805 of those. Um, and then uh, we looked at the Herschel data. The Herschel data is pretty shallow in this field. Only 120 sources in total were detected with Herschel, so at 250 microns. Um, so right off the bat, that tells you that perhaps AGN sources do have lower star formation. Um, but of those 120 sources, 30 were really special. These 30, um, oh, this isn't all 30 of them. It's just a sample. I mean, they all look the same. Uh, so you don't need to see them all. <laughs> um, so these 30 are blue, unobscured quasars, um, but they're all, they're detected in all three Herschel bands. 
Um, so they had to have a lot of far infrared emission. Um, so they look exactly like what you'd expect a quasar to look like. Um, but this is what their full spectral energy distribution looks like. So again, we can look, we see in the optical, this nice declining quasar spectrum, and it's got these broad lines on top of it. Um, so the top one has just really clear, broad magnesium too. Um, and then we can measure the full spectral energy distribution um, over here. And so you can see how much far infrared emission they have. Um, and uh, so I'm showing two really good examples of a different SED fitter that we used. Um, I can actually, I'm not going to bore you guys with this, but I can talk at length about SED fitters and my feelings on them. Um, we actually had a, a really hard time fitting these galaxies because the far infrared is so extreme. All right, so their star formation rates are 500 solar masses per year. Uh, so that's quite a lot. And um, just to convince you that the far infrared really is extreme, um, we can look at these galaxies with their mid infrared colors. So this is wise. So we're showing their wise magnitude on the bottom. Wise is a mid infrared telescope, and then a color, um, a mid infrared color on the on the the y axis. The reason I'm showing this plot is for any of you in the audience who work on AGN and use wise to select it. This is a common diagnostic. And so the cold quasars are shown in purple. They lie exactly in the region where AGN should lie with their mid-infrared colors. All right, so their mid-infrared looks exactly like an AGN. But then we fold in that far infrared data point. And so on the x-axis over here, I have the 250 micron data point. Um, I think this should be a laser, but I don't really want to. Nope, I knew it. I know I was going to press the wrong button. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, it's okay. I'll just point it out. I'm so scared. Um, so the 200 at, at the red shifts that we're looking at. So if you remember, everything around was like redshift of one. Um, so the 250 micron data point. Oh, thank you. Is showing us that that really um, cold dust, and then W4. Is this mid infrared point here? So that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at the ratio of cold dust to mid infrared emission. And then here we're looking at um, these two colors that really quantify how much hot dust you have. The hotter your dust, more AGN activity you have. Okay. So star forming galaxies, so things without an AGN component at all, should lie in this region of this color plot. And then things that are pure quasars, so this is based on the PG quasars, without Star formation should lie up here. Well, our cold quasars lie right in between these two things. So they have far infrared emission that is indicative of a lot of cold dust compared to what we would expect from the mid infrared emission. Where is this dust though? So we know these things have a lot of dust just based on their wise colors and their Herschel, um, but, but where, where is it? Uh, so that's that's pretty hard to measure um, when we don't have resolved imaging of it yet. Um, so we can measure how much is actually located in the nuclear region right around our accreting black hole uh, by modeling the spectra. And so you just take your quasar spectra, you apply a typical quasar template and you modify it by the amount of dust you have because dust is going to preferentially extinct the blue side. So if we have a lot of dust, we should see that those blue wavelengths come down. Uh, so this was, this was an undergraduate project and we found that basically very little modification is needed. And I'm gonna show that here. So if we just focus at the graph on the left, E, B minus V, is essentially the amount of dust you have. It's the amount of a, a light that is being extincted due to dust. Over at zero means you don't have any, whereas 10 would be a very, very high number. So you'd have a lot of dust. So we're comparing our cold quasars here with um, other quasars in our sample. And, um, and then this is our W3 magnitude. So again, this wise mid-infrared magnitude. Um, more dust is now down at the bottom because magnitudes are opposite um, and uh, little dust is up top. So what we see is that compared with other quasar populations, our cold quasars actually have quite a bit of dust. Their W3 magnitudes are higher 
Um, but none of it is in the circumnuclear region. None of it is right around that AGN. Um, we confirmed this with the X-ray as well, because we had X-ray spectra. So it's another undergraduate project and an undergraduate model, a few of the X-ray spectra that we had enough number counts for. Um, and um, she found that most of our galaxies were either unobscured or Compton thin. So very, very little gas there. So these things are not being obscured in the center. So this dust and this cold gas the star formation must be lying a little bit further away um, than the central quasar source. All right, I just want to impress on you how extreme this star formation is. So the top plot shows um, the bolometric luminosity. Bolometric luminosity is how bright your AGN is. It is directly related to accretion rate. So things on the right side are gonna have higher accretion rates, accreting more material, and things on the left side are gonna have lower accretion rates. On the top plot, I this kind of funny parameter, star formation rate divided by black hole accretion rate. What is that? Okay, what that is telling you is basically the energy budget in your galaxy, because both star formation and black hole accretion are what power galaxy emission. There's radiation from these two processes that light up a whole galaxy. And so we have compared with normal unobscured quasars that um, are not detected in Herschel. And we see that our cold quasars have proportionally much, much more of their energy budget is due to star formation compared to um, the normal unobscured blue, similar in every way, except not detected in the far infrared. Okay. Um, so a lot more star formation there. Then we can look at where these things lie on the main sequence. Um, I'm going to come back to the main sequence at a few points in um, in the talk, but the main sequence is basically this correlation that you see between star formation and um, stellar masses. It is useful in that it allows you to identify things that are a little bit weird, that aren't lying on, on there. And so what we see is that the cold quasars have like 10 times more star formation than you would see in a main sequence galaxy. But even the unobscured quasars are actually kind of off the main sequence. And I'm gonna come back to that, to that idea in a second. All right, so these cold quasars reside in star bursting hosts. All right, there is no offset in the time scale between what is happening here. We can also measure their black hole masses. So this is the part of the sample that I have black hole masses measured for. Um, and we can now look at that correlation again between black hole mass and stellar mass. Now, one of the things that I want to point out here is that this is covering a broad redshift range. Um, so we're talking about redshifts of like one to three. The blue line is that local relation. And so we can see where things lie relative to the local relation. And um, if you believe that every galaxy needs to wind up on the local relationship, this can be an informative way to view things. So the cold quasars are all well off that local relation. But what's interesting is the way that they're off the local relationship. It is not random scatter. You don't have some that where the stellar mass is more massive than the black hole mass. They are all, except for these two guys here, they're all above it. They're all above that local relationship. So their black hole masses are huge. And in fact, this one up here, which is nearly has a black hole mass of 10 to the 10 is actually the highest redshift one. But because we know the star formation, I've measured the star formation rates from the far infrared data. That's why far infrared is really useful. Um, and we have measured the black hole accretion rates from the X-ray data. We can show how mass is increasing in these galaxies. And the way that mass is increasing is indicated by the arrows. And the size of the arrow um, just indicates the magnitude. All of these things are moving towards the local relationship um, almost, almost flat. So what we are finding is that the black holes grew first, for the most part, in entirety, because these things, some of them already have black hole masses on par with like the most massive stuff that we see today. Um, 
So I don't think those black holes are going to grow very much more. But the star formation, these stellar masses, they need it to increase quite a bit to hit the local relationship. And in fact, these things have enough gas in them for that to happen. If all of the gas in these cold quasars is converted into stellar mass, they will wind up on the local relationship. So this is telling us that consumption of gas by star formation is more important than feedback, expelling gas from a galaxy. So it might be that you don't need black holes at all to quench star formation. Um, it might be that star formation is enough to do it. Yes. One to three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The proportionally. Yes. Is the length of the arrow indicative of like a gigi or time scale or half a gigi or? Trying to remember what I put in here. I think it's half a gigi year. Yeah. Yes. Studying like these over massive black holes for this, I think we're going to compare it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, some like not every galaxy can end up on the relationship. So, so yeah, and none of those actually make it all the way, right? Like, would that be consistent with how many of the black holes we are finding in the local universe or like not? Yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, so the for the people online, the question was. Um, not everything is going to wind up on the exact one-to-one -one line. Um, so if none of these things wind up on the one-to-one -one line, would that be consistent uh, with what we see in the local universe? Uh, so the problem is, to answer that, actually, I'll just talk about the distance that they are. Um, so this shows the, the scatter, the dotted blue lines are the scatter around the local relationship. These things are all like way too far away. Um, so they need to at least get closer. Um, but then understanding if that would be okay, requires us, to, there's like so many completeness issues there. Um, so we have completeness issues with the local relationship, completeness issues in the sample. Um, so I can't really directly answer that question, but no, they don't all need to wind up exactly on the blue line. They can be a little bit above it, but they need to be closer. Okay. All right, but this leads us to the question, of what exactly is the expected star formation rate in quasars, particularly unobscured quasars. This is actually largely unknown um, because it's really hard to measure uh, because AGN by their nature just outshine your host galaxy. So when you have an unobscured AGN, it's gonna be hard to see the host galaxy. So in our sample, um, Oh, there's too many photons on this screen. It's okay. You don't need to see that image. It's fine. Um, okay. So, so this is this is my graduate student. Um, this is part of his thesis work, um, trying to trying to answer this question. So we took our Stripe 82 sample, the ones that have the 120 Herschel detected sources. So those are shown as the green triangles, and so then all of the cold quasars would be these guys, um, and sorted the rest of the sample into bins by redshift and x-ray luminosity, um, and then stacked the Herschel data so that we could get detections at 250 microns and 350 microns and 500 microns. Okay. Um, so that in that way, so he created average spectral energy distributions. So we're not going to be able to, to, to talk about individual sources, but we can talk in bins of redshift and luminosity, on average, what are the sources doing? And so he was able to do the spectral energy distribution modeling in the same way that we had done for the cold quasars. And what we found, ah, okay, told you we're gonna come back to the main sequence. We're gonna look at this main sequence plot again. So the cold quasars are in the circles. They're all up at the top. They're really faint. Um, okay, so all of these, are the individual Herschel detected galaxies, okay? And then, and so now you can see the redshift distribution. Um, and then we have the stacks. So the stacks where each stack is maybe like a hundred galaxies. What is interesting about this plot, and I realized you guys can't see it because again, photons, there are gray bars here <laughs> indicating like the typical scatter that you see around the main sequence. Um, 
the thing that I want to point out is that number one, there's no correlation um, between location on the main sequence and volumetric luminosity. If your quasar itself was responsible for quenching or occurred after the star formation heyday in your galaxy, you would expect to see a downward, a decrease. But you don't. Um, the other thing is that there's no preferred location for quasars at all. They're all over the place. This is a graph is a mess. Um, and so what it tells us is that um, either on average or in individual galaxies, there, there just isn't, there just isn't this correlation between star formation, declining star formation and increased AGN activity. But just to hit home how truly special the cold quasars are, this is that same, that same idea, the energy budget plot, the star formation rate versus a proxy for black hole accretion rate. Um, all of the quasar populations that we looked at, like here, they have a declining trend. This is due to completeness issues. I think the fact that we see more up here, um, but we compared them with other typical quasar populations. So these things are red quasars. Those are the dust obscured central quasars. Um, these are our, our quasars. And then we compared them with other populations of unobscured quasars. And the cold quasars all have more star formation, even then the red quasars. So we don't think that they lie along the sequence of star formation. We're gonna tell you what we think they are in a minute. Um, but first, but finally, before I do that, the next way that we probe quasar evolution is looking at the morphology, all right? So if these things lie in a merger sequence, you should be able to quantify which merger sequence they, they're in, and, um, and they should be in an earlier merger sequence than say, unobscured blue quasars. Okay, uh, the, the problem here is we don't have good imaging. This is the imaging that we have. Uh, so this is, um, this is from the Subaru, the Hyper Supreme, um, Hyper Supreme Cam. So it's not awesome, um, but it turns out we can tease out some information from something that looks like this, amazingly enough. Um, so this was, this was another undergraduate project and um, she fit different models to the original image. So she fit the standard quasar model. The, the thing, when you have an AGN, you wanna measure the morphology. The thing that you fit is usually one CERSIC profile, one point source. The point source measure, measures the AGN, the CERSIC measures the host galaxy. Um, she found that actually the residuals were really messy when we did that. So instead, um, she fit multiple CERSIC profiles. So just see how many CERSIC profiles it took to completely remove the residuals. All right. So let's look at that first model, the point source plus the CERSIC. So we compared with a control sample of unobscured blue quasars. The CERSIC indexes um, are actually very similar and they're like exactly what you see in the literature for quasars. Um, what's interesting is that the point source, even though these galaxies, these samples were selected to have the same X-ray luminosity, be at the same redshifts, the cold quasars have brighter centers. And I was like, okay, is this a product of the fitting? Um, but it isn't. I went back and I looked at all of the, the SCSS imaging, the UGRIZ, and in the U and the G, the cold quasars are brighter than on average than all of our unobscured quasars. So that's kind of weird. Um, they're brighter in the center, even though nothing else should be different. Then we can look at the multiple CERSIC profiles and the control sample. For most of them, you only need one or two. Again, that makes sense. That's like that point source plus CERSIC profile model. Um, but for the cold quasars, they're a bit messier. You need more CERSIC profiles to remove all of the residuals. This indicates that they live in a slightly messier galaxy. So they could actually be in an earlier stage, an earlier merger stage. Okay, so this was that classic picture of quasar evolution. Um, I know I've run over a lot right now, but the one thing that I want to convince you of is, is no, I don't think so, uh, at least not for everything. For the cold quasars, here's what I think is happening. Um, number one, they are 
produced by mergers um, to, to get that much star formation and black hole growth. And we see that because they have these messier resi residuals. But they don't have any extended emissions. So they don't look like typical mergers. So it's possible that they've already compactified and grown smaller. But then you have the blue quasar phase. So the quasar is the thing where like the black holes are already so massive. It seems like the black hole has grown first. Um, or perhaps the black holes finished growing in their individual galaxies and then they merged. Then we see star formation. So the star burst phase is just now setting in. This is actually very reminiscent. These galaxies are very reminiscent of compact starburst galaxies. They have very similar sizes. They have very similar stellar um, star formation surface densities, but compact starbursts don't have any AGN activity at all. So it's possible that you are moving from quasar to compact starburst, and then you get your elliptical galaxy. So I call that backward growth, and it is something that I am working on piecing together right now, but it's just something I want you to bear in mind if you ever hear about the standard quasar evolution. Yes? So when you talk about compact, what scale should I be thinking about? Uh, kiloparsec. Yeah. Um, all right, so in the last few minutes of the talk, we're going to talk about the boring AGN now, all right? And to really probe AGN statistics, we need to do it in the infrared. Um, the reason is just that the X-ray isn't that complete. You can't see the really obscured stuff. So a brief history of infrared emission. Um, when you have a star forming galaxy, you get this classic infrared shape. So out there um, in the far infrared, you have this cold dust emission. This cold dust emission is due to the large grains that lie in between star forming regions. Um, and then in the mid infrared, you have your polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon features. These are due to small grains that lie within star forming regions themselves. Okay. When you have an active galactic nucleus, you don't see most of that. Um, instead, you see this classic power law emission. This power law emission is um, the torus, so dust that is right near the AGN itself. However, you will still see in a lot of galaxies, cold dust. Um, that cold dust indicates star formation. And so in infrared AGN, if you have a lot of cold dust emission, you would also have PAH features. You just can't see them because the AGN is so bright. It's swamping out the light. And then you have composite galaxies. So composite galaxies are like a pure mix of both. All right, so you see the PAH features, you still see the strong power law, and you see the cold dust. This is due either you've got a heavily obscured AGN or you have a lower luminosity AGN, and that's why you're able to see the, the galaxy. So to find large samples, we use um, color selection. The reason that we use color selection is that it is fastest basically, for identifying, um, doing individual SCD fitting. Again, I have a whole thing about that, but um, it is, a, a, a first thing, it is, it is time consuming. So we use colors. So this is my color selection on the, um, um, this axis, the bottom axis, the X axis, uh, there's a proxy for dust temperature. Um, so we're looking at, again, that ratio of cold dust to really warm dust emission, which is going to change in AGN. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at the torus emission versus stellar emission. Okay, and so AGN move pretty smoothly through this plot as their mid-infrared AGN um, amount of emission changes. And so we can use color diagnostics like this to get a rough idea of what the mid-infrared AGN content of your galaxy is. Um, so we did that because we were wondering how were how do AGN and star formation change together in like the average population? Um, so we looked at the cosmos field. This was my master's student. Um, and we had Cosmos is a great field for this because you've got really deep Herschel, you got really deep at every wavelength. Um, so we have 12,000 galaxies. Um, some of them happen to have an X-ray detection. So those are shown as green. And, um, and we implemented a mass cut. So we're looking at 
I want you guys to remember this because I'm going to come back to this at the end, but we're looking at things that are greater than 10 to the 9.5 solar masses. Why? Because historically, those are the things where AGN selection is more reliable. And then we quantified their mid-infrared um, AGN fraction based on that color diagram that I showed you. Now, infrared color detection, it's really efficient, but it's not super reliable. Um, necessarily, because you can get a lot of different effects mimicking the emission of the other. So we wanted to, to first of all, test how reliable is mid-infrared detection. So to answer that, again, we turned to X-ray stacking. This plot is a lot. So for now, just focus on the top one. Um, so the circles here, these, okay, these are our infrared classified galaxies, but they were not detected in the X-ray. These are the galaxies that were individually detected in the X-ray, and then we also assigned them a mid-infrared color. The triangles you can ignore, um, the referee made us put those in, uh, and so I don't like to talk about them. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what we see is that when we stack and get an X-ray luminosity, um, that everything that we quantified um, as a composite galaxy, so even like a 3% AGN fraction, shows an elevated X-ray detection compared to the galaxies that have absolutely no AGN emission in their infrared spectrum. So as we are moving up in AGN, mid-infrared AGN strength, we are also moving up in X-ray strength. That's pretty, that's pretty well known um, because everything up here is the kind of thing that you find with, with every infrared selection technique. But what we found is with our technique of combining that cold and that warm dust together, we are able to pick up more AGN with weaker mid-infrared AGN fractions. So these are the green things are the things that have absolutely no infrared AGN signature. The um, cyan and the purple things have a little bit of, we call them composite galaxies. And then the orange ones are your classic parallel AGN where you don't see any star formation. Um, and then we just looked at it in terms of, of redshift as well. Um, so the infrared really can be used to pick up these either lower luminosity or highly obscured AGN. All right, told you I was gonna talk about the main sequence again. Um, so here it is. Uh, so now we looked at the star formation rate versus stellar mass for the cosmos sample, again, in bins of redshift. And, um, and then the green lines show um, actually the, the main sequence as measured from other papers. We didn't measure it ourselves. Um, and then we looked at um, our X-ray AGN and then all the other, remember each one of these has like, like a thousand, hundreds or a thousand galaxies in it. Um, each one of our infrared, um, AGN bins as well. And the plot looks like a mess because it is a mess, because there is no simple correlation between AGN activity, be it X-ray or infrared, with location on the main sequence. And there's no clear difference with stellar mass either. Um, all of these things, on average, lie on the main sequence. We don't see any incidence of, of increased AGN emission with declining star formation. Um, so this idea really needs to be just like put to rest. Um, AGN lie everywhere. All right. This is all stacking though, which it, again is it's not what you want to do to really tease out nuances of any kind of relationship. You don't want to have to rely on stacking. Um, luckily, there is a new instrument. Uh, you might have heard of it. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, so just to, just to show you why, um, how much better we can do, these, these are all real images. Uh, this is our Sears data, it was taken back in June. Um, and so you can see, this is IRAC, um, and then this is, this is MIPS. And for those of you who aren't infrared astronomers, um, Herschel is even worse than that. And I mean, I just kind of look at this and I'm like, oh my God, I wrote all my thesis work on like that data. Um, but, but now we have 
And so what's so nice about it is that we have so many different wavelength bands over here that you can really tease out color differences um, and you can individually resolve galaxies. You don't have to worry about things blending together anymore. So I had done some preliminary work on can we use MIRI data to find AGN and composites? Can MIRI data be used to classify this mid-infrared AGN fraction alone? Um, so this was all preliminary work where I had simulated some galaxies um, to see what they did. And indeed, you can actually use just two MIRI colors and you can do a pretty good job of of quantifying the mid-infrared AGN fraction. Um, because again, you're just, you're just really sampling those pH features. What I found though, when writing this paper was that redshift was actually gonna be really important. Um, that you actually have to know which redshift you're at to know which colors combine to give you the AGN fraction. And the reason is this. So this is real data now, okay? So these are our real MIRI observations for two different star forming galaxies. Um, and then the red is Herschel and Iraq and Hubble. Um, if you are only combining four data points and you don't know what part of the spectrum you were on, you used the wrong color, you're gonna get a power law. Um, and so you can easily misidentify your your galaxy as um, as a power law galaxy rather than uh, rather than a star forming galaxy. So this is something that um, currently I have a graduate student working on developing machine learning techniques to fit both the redshift and the AGN fraction at the same time. Um, but luckily, again, JWST pencil beam. So for our Sears data, um, I fit every galaxy by hand, and and that was okay. Um, because I only had like a few hundred to do. Um, yeah, so what, are, what am I gonna do with my time anyway? Uh, so uh, again, these are our, oh my God, I just love it so much. Um, I like, when I made this plot, I like screamed. I was so excited because, okay, these are our MIRI data points. This is my template. So this is my thesis work. And it's not fit to anything else. It's just fit to the MIRI data point. And then I went and I got the Herschel and the HST data and the Spitzer data and I plotted it on top and it matches. Like I did a good job. Um, so <laughs> same thing over here. Um, so again, AGN emission in the far infrared is a lot more uncertain um, than star formation emission is. Like star formation has like this classic shape that you see everywhere. But even with this galaxy, again, it was just fit to the mid infrared, just fit to the MIRI data points. And then everything else is plotted over top to see if it matches. And it does. And so by, by looking at every galaxy like this, um, I was able to assign every galaxy in our Sears data a mid infrared AGN fraction. And we find something really exciting. Um, so first we have the redshift distribution. Um, with the star forming galaxies, you see these peaks. These are due to the um, pH features being brighter. And so they're easier to pick up at certain redshifts. With the AGN, the things that are at high redshift are AGN candidates. Um, I'm calling them candidates until I spectra to confirm it. And we have the spectra, I just haven't looked at them yet. Um, but then we have stellar masses, which are based on HST data. So I'm not gonna say that like these, these could be a little bit uncertain, um, but we see this kind of AGN emission type shape, even in very low mass galaxies. And they're, they're individually detected um, and in fact, we've already confirmed some of these low mass AGN candidates with, with some of our spectra. And so with James Webb, we're really going to be able to find uh, AGN in a regime that we've never seen before. And just to show you, actually, um, do I think that the AGN and the lower mass regime are reliable? I do, um, and here's why. So we can look at the average spectral energy distribution. This is the star forming galaxies. Um, and then I have it sorted in mass bins. And what you see is that the average all has very similar shapes, okay? Because star forming galaxies look like star forming galaxies look like star forming galaxies. They'll have, any, anytime you have a dusty star forming galaxy, it has a very similar shape. Um, the AGN, we can play the same game. 
they're a lot messier. They have a lot more diversity of shape going on here. Um, that's because AGN are mess messier because you could have different proportions of your star formation in your AGN. But when we compare the mass bins, the average spectral energy distribution, it's all the same shape. So I don't think there's anything funny going on in the lower mass bin compared to the higher mass bin. And then finally, okay, got a couple of minutes left. This is great. I'm just going to show you what these things look like. Um, so these are three different Miri filters. So this one looks like it has a companion. Um, I don't know the redshift of this thing, so I'm not positive that it's actually it's companion, but we can see this disk structure in, um, in Miri galaxies that they're in, we're not able to do this with Spitzer like at all. Um, and so some of them have clear disk galaxies and some of them are in point sources. Um, some of them show a nice little title feature up at the top, um, the top left plot. Some of them are really, really faint. So this would be potentially a high redshift or a lower mass one. Um, and we can compare that with the morphologies that we got from Hubble. Um, so these are all of our higher redshift AGN. So these are the Hubble morphologies. Like this one's not even there. But when we look at it with Miri, the disk pops out. And so there had been previously this picture um, that AGN mostly lie in like point source isolated galaxies because they lie in very evolved galaxies because that AGN stage comes after the star formation um, and your galaxy is starting to compactify and you're starting to enter the elliptical phase. We just never had a good enough telescope before to really say that at all. Um, and so this is true actually in the Hubble images, but once you get good enough imaging, those disks pop out and actually it turns out that the, the fraction of disk galaxies just in general in the earlier universe is much higher than we thought. Um, and so um, I guess the, the main point of, of my talk and get to the takeaway, but if I could sum it up for you, is that um, I think we're just beginning to, to really understand AGN and quasar evolution. Um, I think there are a lot of simple prescriptions that people like to think about because, because it's easy, um, but when you actually start looking at populations, they're quite diverse. Um, and I think what we're going to find is that there is no universal picture of AGN growth or quasar evolution that it really just depends on too many different systematics in your galaxy. So, all right, I know I threw a lot at you, so I'm happy to take questions now. Wow, there was more there than I had even hoped for. That was pretty exciting. So uh, thank you, that was great. Uh, do we have any first questions here in the audience? Uh, and anything? Oh, yeah, Tony, of course. Uh, but uh, just in that, you were showing near the end of the black hole mass distribution. And comparing it, yeah. So, how do you get the black hole mass distribution? Like, where do you measure the black hole? Oh, it's not black hole mass, it's stellar mass. It's stellar mass, yeah, for each of those. It's the host galaxy. It's the host galaxy stellar mass. Like the versus the yes. Yeah, really. Yes. So the host galaxy stellar mass has all been measured. It was measured by the candles team, just fitting to the HST, which is why I said it, it's not necessarily the most reliable thing. But again, we're looking at distributions, not individual galaxies. So is your conclusion that uh, planting happens through a supernova feedback, or is there no planting and you're just using up the reservoir of gas and then you're done? Um, I think it depends on type of galaxy. Like you have, like I mean, quenching definitely happens in clusters, right? Through through stripping and stuff. Um, I would say, um, I, I think for a lot of galaxies, uh, it's just the reservoirs being used up through star formation. That's great. That's great. Okay, uh, Sabrina, you were next. Uh, yeah, please. Oh yeah, I'll even bring the microphone over. Yeah. Oh. And then I don't know if charge the microphone anymore. How whole? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, 
So thank you for that excellent talk. I have a question about this plot also. So one of the things that makes it hard to find uh, AGN in lower mass galaxies is the metallicity uh, because, <laughs> because pause change at low metallicity. That's right. Do you have any info on the metallicity of these guys? So I don't yet. Um, again, we just got our spectra taken. Um, so that's going to help with that. Um, the reason why, so I actually removed a lot of AGN from this. This is why I looked at all the, all the data, even though I only fit to the mid infrared, um, is because a lot of these things in the mid infrared, it looked kind of like a parallel, but when you looked at the other data, you saw like this huge stellar bump here. And it just um, that to me screamed low metallicity rather than AGN. The AGN um, were things where I see either a declining stellar bump or like lower um, parallel distribution here. But uh, no, meta measuring metallicity, although to be fair, these are MIRI detected galaxies, so they have dust in them. So I don't think their metallicities are going to be super low anyway. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, so I, I'm sort of interested in another another question having to do with sort of quenching in this idea. Um, so I think, you know, you painted a very beautiful picture in the beginning about sort of the size scales on mm -hmm. this. And, you know, this is like a commonly... Um, of a problem of how do you actually like uh, basically have these scales talk to each other. Yeah. Um, and this all makes a uh, very nice sense, I would say. Um, but I think the the additional complication on all of this is that I'm, I'm curious about your take on is sort of just, um, you know, one could take the Occam's razor approach and say, it's too hard to imagine a coupling between this very small scale of a black hole and a large scale. Yeah. But then when you talk to the theorists, they all say like, we need that energy somehow. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious if you think things can basically be hidden in the analysis that you've done by the fact that AGN flicker mm -hmm. and by this idea that um, the time scale on which you see a, a galaxy actually active wouldn't necessarily capture like a cyclical nature of them or necessarily um, uh, like a, a special a special moment per se with respect to the star formation if there's some sort of lag or delay time from a wind or whatever else. So that was, that's sort of question one. And then I might ask question two, depending. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So yes. So certainly things are complicated by this. Um, this is why actually stacking analyses can be really powerful um because you can you can get around this issue um i will say that so we need um feedback to stop cold gas accretion onto galaxies themselves yeah. but we don't need feedback within galaxies um and so when i'm talking about feedback i'm talking about specifically feedback within the galaxy itself not um not enough to like heat the heat the whole cluster medium um, but the other thing is, um, okay, so there is a correlation. Um, I don't want to say they're decoupled. They're not decoupled. I just don't think feedback is the thing doing the regulating. Um, they are coupled because gas feeds gas, right? You need gas to make star formation and you need gas to make black holes. So the fact that you see a correlation between them is pretty normal. You should see a correlation. But that doesn't mean that there's any kind of related cause and interplay between them. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. My second question was basically whether you thought then the AGN were essentially heating the gas surrounding, preventing yeah. future accretion. And so like maybe yes. the, the star formation burns itself out. Yes. But the thing that's preventing the black hole from continuing to grow and the stars from continuing to grow may in fact have something to do with the AGN heating the surrounding medium. Yes. I agree with that, that's with what you said. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I hope one day we'll have uh, some interesting CGM results that will bear on that, on that possibility. So do we have more questions in the audience here before we have questions on Zoom? Or how is it uh, Henrique had his hand up earlier. Just. Uh, I was just wondering if you've looked at the radio emission of these galaxies, specifically if the fraction of radio emission corresponding to the AGN is similar to the fraction of the mid infrared emission as well? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, so um, for most of the galaxies that I look at, they're radio quiet. Um, and so you don't see any kind of correlation whatsoever. For the cold quasars, um, this is 
actually going to my grad student's thesis, he's working on this right now. Um, what's really interesting is that what we thought we would find is the presence of young jets. Because if you compare red quasars, which are dust obscured with blue quasars, um, you actually see young jets in red quasars and more evolved jets in blue quasars. So we kind of thought the cold quasars would lie in between there. Um, what we're finding is that they don't have any strong radio emission at all. Um, so don't know what to make of that, actually, yet. Right? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Maybe make that our last one for this year. I do want to remind everyone that our postdoc is going to lunch with the speaker, and there will be a dinner this evening. I'd love a head count so I can figure out where we're going to go. So anyone who wants to come to dinner tonight, you do, uh, please let me know. Okay. okay, so the cold quasars and redshifts between like 1.5 and 3, right? Yeah. And they are growing, and you said that there is evidence that they are merging galaxies. Yeah. There's a little evidence, yeah. And by the end of the talk, you also showed those supermassive black holes, those AGNs that are isolated in redshift higher than three. Yeah. So those two information together, for me, what can you say about the actual formation of supermassive black holes if they are first isolated and are already supermassive and then they start merging? and become this other type of AGM? Yeah, that's a great question. That would be really, really interesting. Um, I, I think that's not something that people have really thought about, the idea that your black hole has grown in isolation first, um, because the question is always like fueling. How do you fuel something this quickly? And so like the things that we see at redshift greater than three that are isolated, what was the mechanism for fueling them? Um, I actually don't have an answer for you. I think it's a really great question. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think until we understand fueling in isolated systems, we can't really say. Can, can it just be a statistical problem that we just don't have enough information at higher redshifts? Yeah, so. yeah. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Okay. Um, Tony, were there any questions online? No, we're all good. Okay, great. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. That was fantastic. And she'll be around more this afternoon. There may be a couple of slots still open before dinner. Uh, so please check the spreadsheet for that. Thank you. That was fantastic. How do I turn this off? I don't really care. Someone else will do it. I'm old now.